Hear these words from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither new, nor your son or daughter, nor your man servant or maid servant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Hi, I'm Russ Adams, the pastor at Western Reserve. And before I set up the sermon today, uh, I'd just like to, to uh, give you a couple of announcements and then a, a couple more prayer concerns. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that we we're doing a food drive during the month of September here at the church. Uh, you can drop it off at the church. You can bring it to parking lot worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, and we'll be, we'll be glad to receive it. Uh, also, I can tell you that this Thursday, September the 10th at 6.30 to 8 o'clock, uh, is a Bible study. Lisa Velker is going to be leading a discussion group on how spiritual how, how spirituality develops through our lifetime. And so uh, if you'd like a hard copy of this, call the church and we'll be glad to uh, either mail it to you, snail mail, or we can email you a copy. Uh, also, I wanted to tell you that the organ is installed. If you turn around here, you can see the console. And uh, we still owe about uh, 26000 and a reliable source tells me, correct me if I'm wrong, if every giving unit, there's, there's, there's 70 giving units in this church would give $400, we could pay the thing off. If you'd like to send more than $400, we're more than willing to accept it. So, uh, also I can tell you the Gab sale lives October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, that means that a month from today, it will be over. And uh, I think Joanne will be the happiest person. Uh, and I wanted to say this, I wanted to tell you that it, it kind of goes without saying that even in the middle of a pandemic, if you need anything, you know, we're, we're open, uh, I'll do what I can for you. All you gotta do is call me anytime and, and we will respond. So, and also I can tell you that uh, financially we're kind of holding our own and that's a good thing and, and having a, you know, a healthy church financially is important. Uh, we can do more than just maintain buildings, we can actually help people, which is what we're supposed to be doing. So those are my announcements. And these are the folks that I'd like to pray for this week. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, pray on this Labor Day weekend uh, for all of those folks that are unemployed. Okay? A lot's still going on. We hear a lot about unemployment. I want to pray for those people that are actively looking for a job that cannot find it. I'd like to pray for those people who are underemployed, uh, that, are, that are working jobs when they have skills that they would like to use in another way. And so we'll pray for those people. Uh, I have know a lot of teachers, I respect a lot of teachers, and, and I want to pray for them and the whole system. Such a complicated time. Uh, having students back, you know, uh, some in the class, some not, but we're, we're trying to teach people. That's a difficult thing in the midst of all this. We will pray for them. I want to pray for Jim Watkins, who is dealing with cancer and going through chemo. Uh, I have the sad duty of reporting that John Russo died, and John was such a good friend uh, to this church. We want to ask that we keep Kay, his wife, uh, in our prayers during this time. And um, like everything else, everything is difficult, in including the death process. Uh, I want to pray for Dean Ferris, who will be staying at the Woodlands. Uh, his rehab is over and he'll be staying there. I want to pray for Nadine Roos, uh, who is at the Woodlands for uh, rehab. And also I want to continue to pray for Bill Helzel, who continues to make progress. Um, Edith Moore. Uh, Edith Moore uh, is at Windsor House in, in Canfield now. Uh, we found out this week that she was asymptomatic, but she did have the coronavirus. She is fine today and has recovered, but uh, we need to keep uh, Edith in our prayers and her son and daughter who were doing a really good job uh, of keeping up with their mom. And also I want to pray for everybody that uh, has to decide when to come back inside. At this particular point, I kind of feel like we're going to just say weather permitting. And on the day that I believe that we can get more people inside than outside, I'll do it. Uh, but, but right now, I kind of feel like everybody's happy outside, and we'll be flexible with this thing and, and see how it goes. When the blizzard comes, 
there's an excellent chance we're coming inside. So with all that in mind, I ask that you pray for those things. Uh, this is Labor Day weekend, and on Labor Day weekend, I always like to give you a little bit of history, okay? Uh, the history of Labor Day can be traced back to 1882, okay? There was a guy by the name of Matthew McGuire. Uh, he was a machinist, but he was also uh, the, the secretary of the Central Labor Union of New York. Uh, he said from that position that he thought it'd be a good idea if we had a day to celebrate people who work hard in our country. Uh, it must have been a, a great idea uh, because by 1887, Oregon became the first state to make Labor Day a state holiday. And our man in Washington, okay, Grover Cleveland in 1894, uh, decided that it would be a great idea to make it a national holiday and worked hard to make it so. So you know the truth. Uh, Labor Day is a strange and a unique holiday, and it's like no other holiday on the calendar. Uh, first of all, think about it. On Labor Day, we do not put up our Labor Day decorations. There are no Labor Day decorations. Uh, we do not pass out gifts on Labor Day. We just don't do that. Uh, there are no floral arrangements for Labor Day. There are no cards for Labor Day. The people of that industry have not found a way to market it yet. And traditionally in Camfield, Ohio, uh, you know, traditionally we don't go to church because we go to the fair. Maybe everybody will come to the church this year because, because there is no fair. Uh, Labor Day is like no other holiday. And the truth is we don't even like Labor Day because Labor Day traditionally means it is the end of the summer season and the beginning of something much colder. Yet annually, we observe Labor Day. Uh, this year is, is no exception, and yet this message today is not really about Labor Day. It's really about what you should do on Labor Day, and what you should do on Labor Day is rest. Uh, God knew it from the very beginning that we have limitations. Uh, our, our minds, our bodies, our spirits, they all have limitations, and, and every once in a while, we need to slow down and we need to rest. God commands us that we take a Sabbath weekly, okay? And the Sabbath does two things, recognizing our limitations. It means that we're going to slow down and rest physically, but also it means that God expects us to be recharged spiritually. So two scripture readings for today, the first one from the Old Testament it is from the 20th chapter of Exodus, uh, verses 8 through 11. And the gospel reading is from the second chapter of Mark, uh, 23 through 28. And I've called this message today, God's Misunderstood Commandment. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We find ourselves today in the 20th chapter of Exodus and it's impossible to, to summarize the whole story with a few words. So much has already happened. It will have to suffice to say that God made a great promise to Abram. And Abram's generations to come would become a, a great nation. God remembered that promise with Abram, later Abraham. And those descendants found themselves enslaved in Egypt. Their lives were difficult. And they prayed to God for a liberator, and God heard their prayers and sent them the liberator. His name is Moses. Does any of this sound familiar? I'm sure you've seen the movie. It features a young Charlton Heston. 
It must have been a big day. It must have been a big day when, when all of the Hebrews left Egypt and they faced the harshness of the wilderness. And in the wilderness, God not only provides for them, but God also protects them. And just when life ought to be really good for them, it says that God summoned Moses to Mount Sinai, and as on Mount Sinai, God gave them ten laws, ten commandments that they must follow. And those ten commandments were written in stone tablets. The ten commandments, from our New Testament perspective, uh, will not save your soul, okay? Uh, Jesus is still our only hope of salvation. You know, we're saved by grace and by grace alone. But that does not mean that the Ten Commandments are not viable. They're not worthless. And we know the Ten Commandments, or we used to know the Ten Commandments, because back in the day, as they say, they were mounted on every school wall. The Ten Commandments. You remember them. It says that you shall have no other God before me, you shall not make yourself an idol. You shall not make, take the name of God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie, do not covet. If you're like me and I have to classify everything, you can actually take the Ten Commandments and put them into two categories. Uh, the first four deal with our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationships with the people in our lives. However, it's number four that grabs our attention today. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. All these years later, I've always considered it to be God's misunderstood commandment. On the Sabbath, God shows us that he does love us, that, that he knows that we, we need a, a break once in a while, that we need to, to slow down. First of all, as I said earlier, that there is part of the Sabbath that you need to sit down and rest physically. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, he knew something about work. He, once, he said once that every now and then go away. Have a little relaxation, and when you come back to your work, your judgment will be sure. Go some distance away, because then your work will appear smaller. He's talking about resting physically. And yet the Sabbath is also about being recharged spiritually. An evangelical preacher and radio host Woodrow Kroll said, The God who made us can also remake us. We need to be recharged spiritually. Remember the Sabbath day and, and keep it holy. It's easy to memorize, but, but the truth is we've made it very complex. It was meant to be simple. Do you know anybody um, that, has, that has restricted the Sabbath? Uh, that's what you heard in the, in the gospel reading. Uh, the disciples are, are, are walking through the grain fields, and as they walk along, uh, they have busy hands. They, they take the head of grain and they, they crush it. Uh, it's not a hard piece of scripture to imagine because really nothing happens. They're just walking through the field talking, grabbing kernels. Nobody really seems to care except the legal beagles, and they're all upset about it. They're upset because they're actually technically, and they're not wrong, they're harvesting. It seems kind of crazy how much harvesting can you do with your hand, but, but that's what they were doing. They cry foul. The religious leaders, you know, they knew the law, but somehow they had lost the spirit of the law. The fourth commandment does not exist to limit our fun. It exists so that we can rest physically and be recharged spiritually. Uh, the Orthodox leaders of Jesus' day were, were excellent at, at keeping the law. As a matter of fact, there were the Ten Commandments, and then they, 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 they built around those Ten Commandments something like 1,521 additional laws to preserve those Ten Commandments. And if you look back and you read some of the laws, that these man-made laws that they had created to protect the Ten Commandments, they, they seem kind of, kind of crazy now. 
According to them, on the Sabbath, you were not permitted to cook a meal. According to them, you know, on the Sabbath, you were not permitted to light a fire. On the Sabbath, you were not permitted, according to them, to look into a mirror. That's okay with me. You were not allowed to pick up a needle. They were serious about it. But also, you weren't allowed to pick up a baby. I guess they just cried till the end of the day. According to this man-made law, you were not allowed to save a drowning man. You were not allowed to shave your face. You were not allowed to take a bath on the Sabbath. According to the man-made law, you were not allowed to, to ride a horse or, or, or move a lamp. You were not allowed to take your medicine on the Sabbath, according to this man-made law. On the Sabbath, though, you were permitted to save the ox that fell into a hole. But if you fell into the hole, you had to lay there until somebody came by the next day to get you out. The Orthodox leaders of the faith restricted the life out of the Sabbath. The fourth commandment exists, remember, to help us rest physically, but also recharge us spiritually. Do you know anyone who has restricted the Sabbath? Uh, when I lived in Kentucky, uh, I had a friend by the name of Suzanne. A and Suzanne was raised in a missionary home in Africa. And when she got to high school age, her parents left the missions fields of Africa, uh, moved to the suburbs of Lexington, Kentucky, and they really believed in, in restricting the Sabbath. All those years later, she was still complaining. Some people never move forward, Okay. And the truth is, she would complain that the only thing they were permitted to do during her high school years on the Sabbath was go to church, read the Bible, and pray. She said the best Sabbath she ever had was the time that the Salvation Army Band came to the Free Methodist Church in, in Wilmore, Kentucky, and they were permitted to go and listen to the band. You know that it's true, it's restricting the Sabbath is all, all part of the uh, American tradition. Uh, generations ago, and people told me all the time, especially when I went into the ministry, about how their Sabbath was restricted. You were not permitted to dance, you were not permitted to play cards, you were not permitted to visit friends. Can I be honest with you, I'm glad those days are over. Those folks restricted the life out of the Sabbath. The truth is, the truth is that I'm, I'm glad they're gone. I'm glad those days are over because they lost the heart and the spirit of the Sabbath. The fourth commandment exists so that we can rest physically but also re recharged spiritually. Do you know anybody who has redefined the Sabbath? Okay? The word Sabbath means seventh day. In the Jewish faith, the seventh day is Saturday. Uh, in the Christian faith, the seventh day, you know, we consider it to be Sunday, okay? Because Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday. Every Sunday is supposed to be a little Easter. That's important to remember. But every Sunday is designed to be a little Easter. And so here's the question for you. How much time do you spend on the Sabbath with Jesus? Several years ago, I, I read an article about a company that was having a great problem uh, with their employees, and it was a drug problem. The, 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 the CEO of the company announced that he was tired of the whole thing, and he decided that he was going to test all of his employees on a Monday because he said that he knew that people partied on the weekend. And so every Monday, all the employees had to take a drug test. And that meant that the, the folks that were Jewish observed that Sabbath on the Saturday, Christians observed it on a Sunday, but by Monday, if they were drugging it up, what we find is that, that he would catch them. Uh, that's just such a very fat, sad story because those folks have redefined the Lord's Day into a party day. Do you know anybody who has redefined the Sabbath? What pops into your mind when I say Sunday? Okay? 
Does anybody think God? How many people out there, really, honestly, think it's a day off? You know, it's a day to sleep in, it's a day to rest, it's a day to, to slow down, it's a day for football. But when you say Sunday, how many people really think God? How many people really think Jesus? If you don't believe me, just watch when this all passes and see how many of your neighbors are really going to church on Sunday. It used to be a requirement, now it seems to be optional, and it's the option that a lot of people are not taking. And they'll give you really solid evidence and reasons of why in the world they, they don't go to church. Some people say they don't go to church because, because God is this omnipresent God that no matter where we go, you know, God is there. Uh, that means that if you go to the beach on the Sabbath, you can meet God there. He's everywhere. Uh, that means that, that you can go golfing on the Sabbath, you know, because God is there. It means that you can go for a walk in the woods because God is there. Here's the best part. You can actually stay in bed and do nothing. And God is there. God is everywhere, so, so why go to church? Some people say they don't go to church because, be, be, because there, there's a, such a, a surplus of ugliness within the life of the church. We all know the stories of some of the ugly things that professional clergy have done. Uh, we all know the stories of what, what, what good, well-meaning lay people have done. Uh, we all know that, that in every church there seems to be a certain amount of politics, and I hate to say it, there's a certain amount of drama. One of the reasons that I've existed in the ministry so long is that I try to stay out of the drama, and even recently I had to remind myself just to stay out of the drama and keep going. We don't come to church for drama. You come to church for Jesus. But when I'm really frustrated... I feel like people have forgotten why the church exists. The church exists so that you can experience Jesus. But even with all the imperfections of church, I am convinced that church is the best place to experience God. I know you can experience God at the beach, but be honest, when was the last time you really did? I know that you can experience God at the golf course, and, and Jesus' name may have been yelled out once in a while, but are you really experiencing God? When was the last time you really experienced God in the woods, honestly? When was the last time you experienced God in your bed? I know you can, but you probably don't. And I'm convinced that the churches that will exist, okay, in a hundred years, are those churches that have not become slick in their fundraising? I am convinced that churches that will exist in a hundred years are those churches where people experience God regularly. When was the last time you experienced God regularly? When was the last time you experienced God here at Western Reserve? You see, sometimes we've redefined the Sabbath. You know, sometimes we've restricted the Sabbath. The Sabbath, though, was designed really to help us physically rest and spiritually be recharged. Years ago, uh, Catherine and I sold our cottage at Lakeside in the Marblehead Peninsula, and, and there was a time when the cottage was the focal point of our family life when our kids were small. But our kids weren't always small. They grew up and they had lives and, and suddenly it may have been the focal point but it wasn't anymore. The time came to sell it. Uh, I'll be honest with you because, because I don't want to break, you know, do not lie commandment. Uh, I don't miss it, okay? There's a lot of things that I do not miss about the cottage. Okay, I, I do not miss, I, I do not miss um, the whole environment of, of Lakeside. And I know I'm rare, but, but I always felt like an outsider there. I, I do not miss the gate fee. Right now it's probably $25 a day, plus your car, and I'm sure that that dog pass is coming pretty soon. 
I, I do not miss, I do not miss my neighbors. I shouldn't say that, but it's true. I always thought they were odd, not cool like me. And I do not miss those, those annual repairs in the cottage. It was built in 1883. There wasn't a square corner in the place. And I'll be the first one to admit it, I am not a handyman. I don't miss the cottage. But there's one thing about the cottage that I do miss. I miss that annual trip, usually in October, up the lakeside to shut the cottage down for the year. I found it to be like a, like a 24 hour retreat. My wife would stay home with our daughters and, and I would go to lakeside by myself to, to shut the cottage down. And I gotta tell you, I really miss that 24 hour retreat at lakeside. Because when you went in October, there was no gate fee. You could walk in for free, okay? When you went in October, all your goofy neighbors had gone away. I, I didn't see anybody. And when you went in October, and there was nothing more beautiful than, than the fall in October in Ohio, it was just a beautiful place. I'd get the work done that I had to do quickly, and I'd have the rest of the day free, and for once in my life, I'd actually have the opportunity to do what, what I wanted to do. And so I'd walk through those historic streets of Lakeside, and it was relaxing. I would walk down to the lakefront and out on the dock there and, and watch the water lap up against the shore and I really enjoyed it. I would stand at the end of the dock and look out and see all the colors of the trees and it was gorgeous. It was wonderful. I'd walk back to the cottage and I'd take a nap, okay? I'd get up from my nap and I'd work on my next sermon, whatever it was. And then I'd go for a ride in the car and explore Marblehead Peninsula. Everybody was gone. I'd go to Johnson Island. I think there was a 50 cent toll to get over the bridge. And at Johnson Island, I talked about it last week, there was a Confederate Civil War cemetery. And I would go there and read those names on those stones one more time. And I really enjoyed it. And then I'd go out to dinner at my favorite restaurant. And at my favorite restaurant, I would, I would order my favorite meal. And I would sit there at my table alone. And this was the best part. Everybody ignored me. It was great. But just when the sun was going down, I'd always get back in my car and I'd always go to the Marblehead Lighthouse. And I'd stand there on the rocks and I'd, I'd watch the sun. And as the sun went down, I would stand there in awe and after a while, I would sit on those rocks and I'd watch that sun drop. And before too long, the sun began to set. And there was a million shades of red, a million shades of orange, a million shades of gold. And I would watch that sunset drop under the horizon. And soon it was dark. Have you ever thought about a sunset as I, I sat there, you know, well-fed and sitting and relaxing and comfortable? I'd always think about that sunset and I thought about the timelessness of that sunset. I realized that that sunset had been going down, not exactly the same, everyone's different, long before I was born. And that sunset would still be going down long after my death. And then I would think about God and that sunset and that sun, and I realized it was God who put the sun into the sky. And it was something. That God was so vast, it made me feel so small, and it made me feel protected in a way. I don't know why God wanted to have a relationship with, with people like us. And I've always been dumbfounded by the fact that God called somebody like me, with all my imperfections, into the ministry. And I was always humbled that God would care for me. I got to tell you, I was always completely at peace with God. I missed those trips. I was physically rested and I did experience spiritual renewal. My Sabbath was in the middle of the week. 
I hope I didn't break any laws. When was the last time you experienced a Sabbath? Exodus 28 says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, we are thankful at this particular time for your love for each one of us. Uh, we're thankful that as we live these busy lives and we've been frustrated because we're used to busy and for some, our lives have sort of ground to a halt. But that does not mean that we're experiencing Sabbath every day. Father, you know us. You love us. You know that we have physical limitations. And you know that we need to be spiritually renewed. And so I ask for a blessing upon each one of us at this moment as we come to this communion table. I'm thankful for your love for us all. Once again, I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it says that, that Jesus gathered with his disciples. And at that upper room experience, uh, he could have had that last Seder with, with his biological family. But he chose to be with the disciples, the people that he was closest to. And they didn't realize it then, but we realize it now, what a sacred moment that was. He transformed the Seder. He didn't just recite it, he redefined it. And he gave us this new memorial. And in the middle of this scripted ritual that he had, that he knew that they all knew, Jesus changed it. And Jesus said, after he picked up a piece of bread and broke it, he reminded them that this was something new, that, that this was his body, and that his body was now this piece of bread, and that they were eat it, to eat it in remembrance of him. Then he picked up a, a cup of wine, and it wasn't just wine. He said it was a remembrance of him, it was a remembrance of, of him. And it was a remembrance of, of his blood, that life-giving force. And he encouraged them to drink that wine, to remember him down the road when, when he was gone. All these years later, we celebrate the fact that the disciples are not the only ones with the invitation, but we are too. That Jesus wants to spend time with us. Let us pray. Dear Father, as we have taken these elements we're thankful for your love for each one of us. Uh, we're thankful that you loved us so much that you gave us the Sabbath. And we're thankful that you loved us so much that you gave us the invitation to sit at the table. That it is your greatest desire that you spend eternity with us. And that's why we all are so very thankful for Jesus. Once again, I ask for a blessing upon each one of us. And I just pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. And now may God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you all now and forevermore. Amen. Everybody have a good week and a safe week.